Amen. God is good. God is great. He is faithful. God is great because he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He is almighty and all-powerful. God is good because he is holy. God loves us with an everlasting love. And so it's good to be reminded of these things as we seek the Lord in our worship and in our daily life. Today we want to look at the first psalm together, but look at it in a way that describes the prayer life of an individual. And before we do this today, before we go to God's Word, let us bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, the maker of man's mouth, I come to Thee, Lord, today, asking Thee to have mercy on me, to allow Thy live coal from the altar to come and to cleanse my lips, that I might be able to speak a word in due season to those that are weary, to those that are thirsty, to those that don't even realize where they are. I ask, O oh Father God, that Thou wilt immerse me in Thy Holy Spirit, that I might simply be a mouthpiece for Thee today. For I long to give no opinions of my own, no wisdom of my own, no thoughts of my own, but I long to present Thy Word in its truth. Help me, O oh Lord, to expound Thy Word and expound Thy Word in our hearts, write Thy Word in our hearts, that we might not sin against Thee, and that the convictions and impressions that are made today will never be effaced. They will cause us to walk as renewed and revived people, reformed people, who will walk and be as Jesus was. O oh Lord, we live in a prayerless age, and we long to be men and women of prayer. Help us to know what this way of prayer is, that we might discover its blessedness, and that we might be able to have thy peace that surpasses understanding, and to have thy joy which no man can give. In Jesus' name we ask all these things. Amen. Book of Psalms is called in the Hebrew Tehillim, which means praises, <clears throat> and it comes close to the word Tefillim, which means prayer. In the book of Psalms, we have the Torah in miniature. Just as there are five books in the Torah, the Law of Moses, so there are five, five parts in the Psalms. It is the law of praise and prayer that we find therein. Man is in trouble, as one scholar says, God gives relief. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown declare that the distinguishing feature of the Psalms is their devotional character, whether their matter be didactic, historical, prophetical, or practical. It is made the ground of prayer or praise or both. And another scholar says, The Psalms then are the uttered or spoken harmony of the soul of man under all experiences, a harmony which has its source in God himself, the free obedience of the heart to him. The Psalms also are Christ-centered. There are many authors, but there is one true author alone, the Holy Spirit. And Jesus Christ is presented in all of them. The current situation in the church and in the world is dire. We live in a prayerless age. We live in an age where we do not communicate with God as much as we ought to. In fact, more people are seen bowing their heads to their cell phones than to prayer. There is more devotion to technology than there is to the Holy Word of God. And the spirit of prophecy declares to us in manuscript 96 how terrible it is when the acknowledgement of God is not made when it should be made how sad to humble oneself when it is too late why or oh why do not men heed the invitation the psalmist said when thou said seek ye my face my heart said unto thee thy face Lord will I seek when God speaks into a heart that has been softened by the grace of God and by the mercies of God, the heart becomes softened and the heart responds, Thy face, Lord, will I seek. Here we have the invitation in Psalm 1. Psalm 1 is considered the preface to the Psalms. 
One calls it the Psalm of Psalms because it describes in a nutshell the main purpose of the Psalter and of prayer. Transformation. Transformation in the midst of trial, in the midst of trouble, in the midst of joy, in the midst of pain. Many times we believe that prayer is merely asking, but it is not merely asking, it is basking in the presence of God and being changed thereby. It is not merely talking to God, but taking God at His word and taking God completely into the life. And so in Psalm 1 today, we want to look at the two ways. The blessedness of prayer. First of all, we want to look at the blessedness of prayer. Secondly, we want to look at the delight in prayer. Third, the prosperity of prayer. And fourth, the endurance of prayer. First of all, the blessedness of prayer. Please open your Bibles and turn to Psalm 1 as we look at it verse by verse and see what the Word of God has for us today. Psalm 1 begins with the word blessed, and that word in the Hebrew is in the plural. The blessedness is of the man. Blessedness is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That word blessedness means happiness, happinesses, joys. Uh, many people are not happy today. They're not content. They're not joyful. Why? Because they seek happiness apart from God and apart from prayer. But the man who spends time with God, the man, the woman who loves God that much, will have joy unspeakable and full of glory. His happiness will be multiplied. It will be blessedness upon blessedness. He will live a life of beatitude. Notice the second thing about this verse. It says, blessed is the man. Charles Haddon Spurgeon points this out very eloquently. He says, you notice it doesn't say, blessed is the king. Blessed is the potentate. Blessed is the rich man. Blessed is the popular man. Blessed is the educated man. Blessed is the great man according to society. No, it says merely, blessed is the man. Which means, oh blessedness of blessedness, that anyone can come and have this beautiful relationship with God. That it doesn't matter how rich we are or how poor we are. Blessed is the man that draws near to God. Blessed is anyone. Now notice the hindrances to true prayer. The first thing we notice about this man is that he is blessed beyond measure because he avoids something. It is what he avoids that allows him to be blessed first. What does he avoid? Number one, it says, he walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. That word walk means to talk, to discuss, to grow. That word counsel means to advise or to plan. And that word ungodly means the wicked, the immoral, the atheist. This man does not live his life, does not pattern his life according to the advice and the planning and the thinking and the atmosphere of those who are apart from God. He doesn't spend this time listening to the things of the world and the philosophies of the world to make decisions in his life. Rather, the decisions he makes are based on the word of the Lord. Now you may say, well, of course, that's obvious, isn't it? But is it? Is it for the Christian today? Is it for us that are sitting here today? What do you spend more time in during the week listening to, thinking about, reflecting on? It is what you become. What you think about is what you become. And you may think that because we live in an informational age today, that there's so much information at our fingertips that we can access whatever we want. All that information transforms us either into being godly or being ungodly. There are two servers, as it were, in our minds. And either we're building up the one with all this information or the other, and it is what we are becoming in character. I want you to notice that. In Luke chapter 7, verse 30, we have the example of those who rejected John the Baptist and consequently rejected Jesus Christ himself. When Jesus was speaking and he was giving the eulogy of John the Baptist, and he said, what did you go out to see? A prophet? Much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, verse 27, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And in verse 29 it says, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. 
But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. What did they reject? They rejected the counsel of God. Because when Jesus was speaking, it was God speaking. And when the word of God speaks, it is God speaking. And we have two choices. We can either accept the counsels of God or we can reject them. We can read the Bible all we want, but if we don't live by it, then we're not really reading it. We can say we read chapter after chapter, day after day. But if the counsels of the Bible do not become the man of counsel for our lives, and they don't permeate every aspect of our being, then we're not truly taking the Word of God as it needs to be taken, are we? We're not truly reading it as it needs to be read. And you notice, these Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves, being not baptized of John. Why? Because the baptism of John was a baptism of repentance. It was a baptism of humility. It was a baptism where they had to come and acknowledge themselves as sinners before God. And that is the first step. When we approach God, when we get on our knees before God, we need to recognize His holiness, His graciousness, His greatness, His grandeur. But at the same time, we need to recognize our sinfulness, our helplessness, our lowliness before Him. It is the first and primary realization into entering into a true spirit of prayer is humility. The realization of who we are coming before. That's why the Pharisees rejected him and the publicans accepted him because the publicans knew they were sinners and they were reacting appropriately. In Matthew chapter 22, 15, because they rejected the counsel of God, notice what kind of counsel they now started listening to. They started listening to their own counsel. And in Matthew chapter 22, verse 15, the Bible says, after Jesus had given the parable of the wedding garment, it says, then went the Pharisees, in Matthew 22, 15, then went the Pharisees and took counsel how they might entangle him in his talk. So the counsel of the Pharisees now consisted in trying to trap Jesus rather than trying to accept Jesus and his word and submitting to it. And so often that's what happens when men do not spend time in prayer, time in divine things. When they don't spend time in humbling themselves before God, they end up even questioning the word of God itself and even trying to trip up the word so that they can continue in their sins. It is the same problem. And then we find them again in Acts chapter 9, 23. Now the Jews themselves who had followed the counsels of the Pharisees in Acts chapter 9, verse 23. Notice what happens there. Acts 9, verse 23. This is regarding Saul who became Paul of Tarsus and how he was converted, how he had that vision in Damascus and he fell to the earth. And he accepted Jesus as his Lord and Savior. And, and then straightway he began in verse 20 to preach Christ in the synagogue that he is the Son of God. And, and many people were amazed and they said, isn't this the same fellow who was trying to destroy the, Jew, the, the, the Christians? Now he's speaking and teaching their doctrine? What a tremendous transformation. But notice in verse 23, it says, And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to do what? To kill him. This counsel, when it is not from God, it tries to slay and kill and exterminate the spiritual life in the soul. It begins to cut off the life that is pleasing to God. It begins to cut God off from the life and it begins to live a life of misery, of hatred, of complaint, of anger, and of unholiness. The Bible says that the Father and the Son had a council of peace so that they could arrange for the salvation of the world, to offer salvation to all who had sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And that council of peace was rejected by Satan, and then it was rejected by Israel. How about us? Are we rejecting that council of peace today? Are we following our own counsels? Are we living life according to our own parameters? Or are we walking by and living by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God? That is the standard, my dear brethren. That is what the praying man, the blessed man, avoids. 
He avoids the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't walk in that way. He doesn't make decisions in that sense. He is like, like Enoch who walked with God. He is like Noah who walked with God. He is like the psalmist in Psalm 33, 11, who says, the counsel of the Lord standeth forever. Because the counsel of the ungodly is here today and gone tomorrow. It is shallow. It will never get you anywhere. It will never give you anything of lasting value. The psalmist says, Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me into glory. In Exodus chapter 18, verse 19, God himself speaking says, I will give thee counsel. And in Isaiah 9, 6, Jesus is called the counselor. And he is a mighty counselor. And he waits every day. He calls upon you every day to give you his counsel on how to live. Do you hear his still small voice every day? Do you seek to hear it? Or do you seek to hear rather the opinions of your own thoughts, the counsels of your own mind, the counsels of those around you? Which counsels are you following? The righteous man, the praying man and woman, they avoid, they do not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Secondly, they neither stand in the way of sinners. They, they, they do not, that word stand means to stay behind. Now, so this man is walking at first. He's walking and trying to walk in the ways of the Lord. And then suddenly he stops. And he starts listening to the counsels of the ungodly. The ungodly man. And then he stands in the way of sinners. That word way means the course of life. The manner or the custom. So now he listens to the counsels. And he starts to follow them. He starts to use them in the course of his life as his manner and his custom is. And, and, and they are called sinners, criminals, offenders, one who misses the mark. Sinners always love to get together and tell other people that it's okay to sin. They love to get together in clusters and in groups and tell other people that sin is okay. That there's nothing wrong with it. That you're okay continuing in the way of sin. Because after all, God loves you and He loves you even though you're a sinner. Yes, He does. He loves you even though you're a sinner. But you will not be able to take advantage of that love and transform your character unless you learn to spend time in prayer so that God can give you the power and the strength to avoid sin. To avoid sinners. This man doesn't stay behind to spend time with sinners. The Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard. It's a hard life in sin. I know it. I've been there. And many of you do have, you, too, you have too. You know it's hard. You know that Christ's yoke is easy and his burden is light. Because you know that no matter what you have to suffer for Christ, the fact is you are not only suffering for him, but he is helping you through the suffering by being in you. Giving you the guidance to be able to suffer valiantly for him. Without him, we cannot suffer the least of offenses. With him, we can suffer through anything. What is the opposite? The opposite is standing fast in the faith, as 1 Corinthians 16, 13 says. Stand fast in the Lord. Abide in me, Jesus says. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The sinner makes a way away from the life and Christ. Uh, Christ became sin, who knew no sin, to make a way unto life everlasting. Christianity is called the way in Acts chapter 9, verse 2. Therefore, when we tarry in Christ in prayer, we begin to walk in the ways of His righteousness. The first steps toward walking in the way of God is on your knees. It is in prayer. It is in humility. Isaiah 30, 21 says, You will hear a voice behind you saying, This is the way. Walk ye in it. When you spend time in prayer, God begins to guide you. His counsels begin to guide you. His word begins to open up before you. And now you begin to walk in His ways and you begin to stand for Him rather than standing for the things in the world. I don't know if you noticed, but when people want to defend their sinful lifestyle, they will stand in front of anybody and defend it. I know, I used to be like that. Nobody could tell me I was doing something wrong. I would stand up and say, no, 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 I'm okay. Everything's okay with my life. They will stand through thick and thin, through insult, through mockery, through scorn, to defend their sinful lifestyle. But we don't have enough courage to stand for Jesus Christ. You know the old saying? 
The man who can stand up to anything is the man who has first knelt down on his knees before God. That is a person who can stand for God in times of trial and of trouble. Thirdly, this man does not sit in the seat of the scornful. So we have him walking, and he's walking, and he's hearing the counsels, but he's walking, but then he stands still, and he begins to imbibe those counsels, those ways of sinners, and now he begins to start living like them, and now he settles himself in to the ways of the ungodly. He sits down on the seat or the chair of the scornful or the heretic. He becomes comfortable or she becomes comfortable in mockery and treating sin and heavenly things lightly. In treating the word of God lightly. In treating prayer lightly. Now this ungodly person who has taken, been taken in by the hook of the ungodly now begins to look at these things and say, you know what, it's not so bad. And God's word is not so serious. And God's things are not that serious. Come on, God is not that particular. God's particularity, brothers and sisters, is your salvation. If God was not so particular, if a doctor is not so particular with the surgery, you're going to leave out there in a hearse. God's particularity is His mercy. The fact that God is so particular is because the way to heaven is so narrow. And he wants us all to go into it. And the narrowness of the prayer life, that is the prayer life. The prayer life allows us to see the narrowness of the way. It allows us to look at the way clearly and to see the ways of sinners. And it allows us now to not desire it anymore and to see, seek to oppose it. The opposite of sitting in the seat of the scornful is Ephesians 2, 6, which says we are seated in heavenly places with Christ. Now, to me, that's an amazing verse, brothers and sisters, because what it's saying is you can be in this world of sorrow, of trial, of problems, of difficulties, of depressions, of all these things. But once you get down on your knees and your heart reaches up to God, you are then seated in heavenly places with him. You can be in heavenly places even though you're on this earth. You can be seated in heavenly places with Christ. You can be in an atmosphere, a heavenly, beautiful atmosphere, any time you choose to. And yet how often we don't choose to. We don't spend time in that heavenly atmosphere. And as a result, we become anxious, we become burdened, we become angry, we become unstable, and we wonder why all these things are happening to us when we have not spent time sitting with Christ in heavenly places. Hearing His beautiful voice, God's seat is called His mercy seat. And we can come boldly to the throne of grace to find help in time of need. But it's also called the judgment seat. We come in the mercy of God. God allows us to enter in so that He can show us His mercy and His love. And then He reveals to us where we are and where we need to be to reveal to us His judgment. When we enter in prayer, God begins to speak to us now and He begins to show us the changes that need to be made in our lives. But if we don't spend that time with God, we will never hear it. I've told you this before, but you know, we talk about the investigative judgment and we talk about what that means and, and we talk about 1844 as the number and everything and that's good. But do we realize and do we recognize that the whole point of the investigative judgment is entering into the process whereby Jesus and I now begin to consult together so that he can prepare me for my character for heaven? That's what the investigative judgment is? It's not something to make me tremble because I don't know what it's all about. It's something to make me earnestly desire and thirst to spend more time with God so that He can reveal my character to me and He can tell me what I need so that I can be in heaven when Jesus comes. It's what He wants more than anything else. Do I want it that bad? But no, we obscure the doctrine. We mess up the doctrine. We, we try to lighten the doctrine and make it light or we try to make it too heavy or whatever we do, but we don't get the whole point of it. That Jesus is waiting every day as our heavenly intercessor. For us to intercede, to confess, to come to Him so we can have characters prepared for heaven. That is the blessedness of prayer. And, and, and if we don't take part in that process, brethren, we're not going to make it. And I don't tell you that to frighten you. I tell you that because it's true. I don't want my blood on anybody's head later on or anybody's blood on my head. 
I want to be able to be told you told them and they heard and praise God some of them many of them I wish all of them came to their senses and said yes this is what we ought to do verse 2 the delight of prayer but his delight is where in the law of the Lord and in the Hebrew it literally says is only in the law of the Lord his delight is only in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. That word delight means value. The thing he values the most is the law of the Lord. The thing he desires the most is to read the law of the Lord. The, the thing he's willing to do the most is to obey the law of the Lord. His greatest pleasure is found in being obedient to the commandments of God. This is the blessed man. Now what does this mean? What is God's law? God's law is a transcript of his character, is it not? If God's law is a transcript of this character, what is this man delighting in, ultimately? He's delighting in God himself. He's delighting in God's character. When it says of God, he is gracious, he is merciful, he's long-suffering, he's holy, he's just, he's good. This man delights in those attributes. He doesn't take them for granted. He doesn't take advantage of them. He doesn't seek to minimize them. He doesn't like some and hate other attributes. He loves all the attributes of God because he delights in God himself. This is a man who spends time in prayer. And because he spends time in prayer, his delight is in the law of the Lord. He delights in God God's counsel rather than walking with men he meditates on God's way not on the sinners way day and night he's seated he's rooted he's grounded in God he's not scornful but he's loving he's faithful the Apostle Paul tells us in Romans chapter 7 verse 22 for I delight in the law of God and then he says this, after the inward man. Now catch that very carefully. I delight in the law of God, Paul says, after the inward man. When I used to be a Pharisee, Paul is saying here, I delighted in the law of God according to the outward man. I wanted people to see me keeping the law on the outside, but I wasn't keeping it in order to be transformed from the inside out. I was keeping the law so other people could look at me and say, look how he keeps the law. Now he says, when Christ came into my heart and he changed me, now when I look at the law, I don't want, just want to keep the law on the outside. I want that law to transform me inside out. I want it to transform even my motives. That's why Jesus said, you've heard of old times them that said, you shall not kill, but I say unto you, if you hate your brother in your heart, you're in danger. Because he was trying to show those Pharisees, look, Yes, you may not have murdered somebody, you may not have taken a knife and, and plunged it into somebody, but you hate so many people that if you had the chance, you've already killed them in character. You've already killed them with your looks, you've already killed them with your speech and your conversation. You've already killed them. Goes in the inside. And here Paul is saying, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Now I delight in God's character. I want to be like Christ. And the more time we spend praying, brothers and sisters, in quality prayer, and my dear friends, the more we will delight in the law of the Lord, the more we will want to be like Jesus. Jesus himself said in Psalm 40, what did he say? Lo, I come, in the volume of the book it is written of me. Lo, I delight to do thy will, O my God. Yea, thy law is where? Within my heart. Jesus was the example for us. He delighted in the character of his father. He followed the character of his father. Is your pleasure found in God's character and commands? Do you value God above all other desires? Do you pray in pleasure and in faith? Do you pray knowing whom you are addressing? We've lost the sense of that. In the old days, the Christian would come and they'd spend a good hour before they'd even open their mouth and speak to God. Because they wanted to enter into that heavenly atmosphere so that when they spoke to God, they realized they were addressing the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because they revered God and they loved Him and they delighted in Him. Do we? 
The world has so many other delights to throw at us. We must refuse them and reject them and we must bask in the sweetness of the delight of knowing Jesus and his character. Meditate on this law day and night. That word for meditate means to mutter, to murmur, to ponder, to mourn, to roar, to talk, to utter. Day and night, this man spends all his time in the Word of God in terms of not only reading it, but meditate on it, meditating on it. You know, some smart aleck will say at this point, what, we're only going to sit there and read the Bible all day? You'd be more profitable doing that than what you do most of the time. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is, when this man spends his time reading the Word of God, he then takes the Word of God with him wherever he goes. And he meditates on the Word of God. The reason you put the Word of God into your mind and into your heart so that when you're working, when you're playing, when you're fellowshipping, whatever you're doing, that Word now is meditating. You're meditating on that Word. And how is it you can live that lesson out in your life that day? How it will apply to the various situations and the various turns and twists of life. The beautiful thing is that the Word of God will meet any area of life that you're going through. You don't have to worry. You just have to meditate on the Word of God. Seek to know God's Word. Seek to think about God's Word. But also here it means praying the Word. How, how, many, how often do we pray the Word of God? God loves to hear His Word prayed back to Him. He loves to hear His promises, His character, even His judgments. When you have a child, and your child says something that you say uniquely in your own way, don't you just love it? Your own child is kind of, I'm saying good things now, okay? So don't go that way. But when, when your child repeats something good that you've said or, or, or demonstrates and imitates a beautiful characteristic of your life, don't you like that? Don't you get a delight out of that? How much more God when he sees his children imitating Jesus Christ? When he hears his children giving the word of God back to him. When you read of the prayers of all these great men and women in the Bible. Moses and Daniel. And, and all these great men and women. And Deborah. Uh, and, and, and Hannah. What, what are they quoting? They're quoting God's word back to him. Their prayers are saturated with scripture. Because these men and women were saturated with scripture themselves. They were able to meditate on the word of God. And what, what we meditate on will change us. Just like what we eat changes us. What we meditate on makes our character. Pray the Psalms. Take a Psalm and go verse by verse and say, for example, in verse 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. O Lord, if I've walked in the counsel of the ungodly, forgive me in this area and in this area. And Lord, help me to refuse the counsels of the ungodly. And go on with that prayer and claim the promises in that Psalm. Many people give the excuse and they say, well, I have nothing to say to God. Read His Word and you'll have plenty to pray about. Meditate on His Word and pray His Word back to Him. And you will see that your prayer life will expound by leaps and bounds. And you'll be spending hours praying to God because you're praying His Word right back to Him. That is how the Word of God works. The delight of prayer is that we delight to meditate on God's things. Joshua was told this. Joshua was given the, the, the way to success after Moses had died. And now jo Joshua had big shoes to fill. And he felt incompetent. He felt that he could not do it. But God said to him in verse 6 of Joshua 1, Be strong and of a good courage. And then he says in verse 8, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Did you notice what he said? He said, don't let this law depart from what? From your mouth. Because he wasn't only to read it, he was to speak it. It was to become a part of his conversation. It was to become a part of his life. So often we read the word of God, but the things that come out of our mouths are opposite to it. And we don't realize that the words we speak affect others and they also affect us. They taint us spiritually or they bless us spiritually, depending on what we speak. But when we spend more time in the Word of God, our conversation will be holy. Our conduct will be holy. Our words will be holy. 
And in a sense, we will carry around that atmosphere that God wants us to carry around. Mason says the breath of prayer comes from the life of faith. When we believe in God, when we love Him, we will delight in His law, we will delight in His word, we will delight in His character, we will delight in all these things. We will think more about God than about anybody else. And we will long to know God more intimately. Because you know what? God can never be known in His ultimate way. You will never ever plumb the depths of God's character. We will be studying for eternity to get to know God. So isn't it about time we start now? The characteristic of a heavenly man, a praying man, a heavenly woman, is a man and a woman who want to know more of God and they're not satisfied with what they already know, but they want to know more of His character. Not more of uh, the way some guy spins his theology. Not more of the way some guy tricks uh, this and, and throws that into theology. We're talking about knowing God intimately. And the most intimate way of knowing Him is spending time in prayer and the reading of the Word of God. Notice now verse 3, the prosperity of prayer. And He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit in His season. His leaf also shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. He will be like a tree planted. A tree planted. A tree can be as strong as it wants to be. But if it's not rooted into the ground properly, it will keel over and die. As big as a tree can be, as humongous as it is, as, 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 as strong as it looks, if it's not rooted, it's going down. It's rotting from the inside out. And many people today look like that. They act spiritual, they look spiritual, but they have not rooted and grounded themselves in Christ. And the only way to plant spiritual roots, my dear brothers and sisters, is to spend time in prayer. Can't do it any other way. That's the only way we can plant roots. This tree has been planted where? By the rivers or the rivulets of water. By rivers of water. Ellen White talks about this kind of tree. She says, seek to be an evergreen tree. Wear the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Cherish the grace of love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. This is the fruit of the Christian tree. Planted by the rivers of water, it always brings forth its fruit in due season. Manuscript 39, 1896. What I love about the evergreen tree is this. It's always green. You notice that? Summer... Winter, spring, fall, that pine tree is always green. It doesn't change. The, the elements around it do not change how it looks and how it feeds and how it is. The, 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 nothing grows pale in that tree. It remains evergreen. So is the Christian to be. A man or woman who plants themselves in a life of prayer will not be moved by the circumstances of life, will not be moved by the changes of, 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 of life, but will constantly stand strong and bold for Jesus Christ. He will be like a tree planted by the rivers. And these rivers of living water, they symbolize something. What Jesus says in John 7, 38 is the symbol of these waters. If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink, Jesus says. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And this he spake of the Spirit of God. Rivers of living water. Saturated, allowing your roots to be marinated in the water of the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful life that is. To say to God, Lord, fill me to the brim with thy Holy Spirit. I want nothing more. I thirst for nothing more. Fill me with thy Holy Spirit, O Lord, to the brim. And if there's anything obstructing that water from gaining access into any part of my life, Lord, take that obstruction away. If there's any desire that's keeping me from that, having those rivers of living water overflowing in me, take, take it away, Lord, and give me that water so that I may not thirst again. His leaf shall not wither, the psalmist says. Or fade. You know that a leaf is withering and fading when, when something has happened to obstruct it from its source. It begins to lose its color. So the Christian, you know when a Christian begins to lose their color for Jesus, they begin to lose their vivacity, they begin to lose their, their life-giving uh, their, their life principle, they begin to lose their, their excitement for Jesus, they begin to become lukewarm because something is obstructing the channel. But this man makes sure... This woman makes sure 
that no matter what happens in their life, they will not sever their ties with Jesus. What was the most important thing about Jesus' life? His connection to his Father. That was the number one thing in Jesus' life. The thing that gave him the most fear and trepidation on that cross was the fact that his humanity was going to be severed from, from his Father. And that God was going to put the sins of the whole world on his shoulders. He was going to become sin for us on that cross. That is what frightened him more than anything else. Because he was always connected with the Father. And he always wanted to be connected with the Father. And so that life-giving principle when it enters into the Christian life. Has the same desire that we will never be cut off from the presence of God. And if we lose him by things in the world or things that take place. Or, or, or we find ourselves going distant from him we will make it right to join with him again. We will want to be with him again. Everything that he does will prosper. That word prosper means to push forward, to break out, to be good. Everything that he does will have the goodness of Christ in it. It will have the flavor of the honey of Jesus in it. All his good works will be prosperous in the sense that they will break out it's not going to be himself forcing himself to do what God wills him to do. It's going to happen automatically because he has Christ living in him and Christ will break out before him. People will see Jesus in him. I love what George Meredith said. He said, he who rises from his prayers a better man, his prayers have been answered. Think about that. Why do we go to, to prayer? Simply to ask for what we want. If that's all we go to prayer for, then we're wasting our time. Because if God's going to give what we want to an unregenerate heart, to a heart that does not love Him, to a heart that will misuse His gifts, then He is giving these things in vain. He will not give them. When we go to prayer, the first desire of our heart is to be changed. To be made better men, better women. To be made holy men and holy women. Only then, when God gives, we will use it on the right thing. And we will appreciate it. And we will be grateful for it. And we will love it. That's why James says, you ask and you receive not because you ask amiss to do what? To consume it upon your own lusts. The prosperity of, a, of prayer is a changed, transformed life. And the more we root ourselves and drink of Christ, the more Christ's character will flow in us and through us. W. Graham Scroge says this of this passage here. It says, But there's also a positive. The secret of a life that is acceptable to God is a delight, meditation, and continuance in the law of the Lord. The true Christian is a Bible Christian. And such an one would be characterized by, number one, vitality. He is a tree. Security. He's planted. Capacity by the runnels of water. Fertility that bringeth forth its fruit propriety in its season perpetuity its leaf also shall not wither prosperity and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper is this a portrait of you it is of your master when people look at you do they say this is a living christian do they say that this is a secure christian you are rooted and grounded in christ when they look at you are they able to say that this christian has capacity fertility that is they produce the fruits of righteousness, propriety, they know the timing of God and they submit to God's timing, not their own. Perpetuity, they are consistent in their spiritual lives and prosperity. This is how Jesus lived, is it not? Jesus delighted in the ways of the Lord. He did not sit with the scornful. He did not stand with the sinners. He did not take the counsel and walk in the counsel of the ungodly. When he was on this earth, he sought to reach those people, but not in their atmosphere. He carried within himself a holy atmosphere of his father because he spent time with God. This was his delight. And finally, the endurance of prayer. Verses 4 to 6. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. There are only two ways, my friends. Only two ways. 
It is either the way of God or the way of the world. You can't be in between. Once you're in between, you're already in the world and you're already tainted. It must be one or the other. The ungodly are unrooted and thus become brittle, disconnected, dry, and dead. The wind does not help them, but instead of the wind giving them a, a sweet refreshment, the wind actually takes them away. They become chap. Notice now the results of a prayerless life or a weak prayer life. First of all, you become unsubstantial. You become so weak in your spiritual life that the slightest thing can blow you away. The slightest wind of doctrine, the slightest problem, the slightest inconvenience will blow you away from Christ because you have no rootedness and no substance in Him if you don't spend time in prayer with God. Secondly, notice the next thing that happens, the result of a prayerless life. They will not stand in the judgment. They will not be able to stand in the judgment. When God judges us, He wants us to be able to stand. He wants us to be able to stand in Christ and to say, I have followed Thee, my Savior. I have been with Christ. I give Him all the glory. I have followed Him. He wants us to be able to stand in the judgment. He, he is preparing us for that now. But if we're not listening to Him and we're not spending time with Him, we're not going to be ready. These men will not be able to stand. They're the men who cry out to the rocks and the mountains to fall on them because great is the wrath of the Lamb. The wrath of the Lamb has come. And they ask the question, who shall be able to stand? They won't because they haven't stood for Jesus on this world. How on earth will they be able to stand when He comes? God wants us to stand in the judgment. And my dear brothers and sisters, the time is coming soon when we will have to make an account to God for the moments that we've lived, the things that we've said, the actions that we have committed, that time is a coming. Are you going to be ready? Are you going to be able to stand, my dear ones? And then it says he cannot sit. He will not be in the congregation of the righteous. In other words, this man will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They will not be able to congregate with the righteous. Why? They will not be in heaven when Jesus comes. Why? Because in heaven, what do they love to do in heaven? They love to give glory and praise to God, the King of kings in heaven. That's their constant cry in heaven. In heaven, all glory and all attention and all praise and all worship and all energy and everything good and everything decent and everything delightful goes to God. They love Him so much in heaven. The angels are waiting to do His will. They love to be around this throne, but when He tells them to go, they don't ask questions, they go. But they can't wait to come back because they want to be with God. And these people, they didn't have that kind of love for heaven on this earth. Earthly things attracted them. They found their joy in unrighteous things. They found their joy in ungodly things. They, they found their joy in indecent things. And therefore, how on earth are they going to enjoy heaven? That's why God wants to transform us now before it's too late. Wants to take away all those desires for ungodliness, all those gravitations toward ungodliness. He wants to take all that away so that we can be citizens of heaven now. Did you know that you can be a citizen of heaven beginning today? That you can begin to live like a citizen of heaven today? That, that God wants that from our lives because when He comes to take us into heaven, there will be nothing of this world in heaven, nothing of this sinful world. So there must be nothing of this sinful world in our hearts if we're going to be in heaven when Jesus comes. Habakkuk 3.6 says, His ways are everlasting. The ungodly, as you can see, is not everlasting. The Lord knoweth the way of the righteous. 2 Timothy 2.19, Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are His, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ do what? Depart from iniquity. The Lord knows who belongs to Him. And whoever belongs to Him 
will not want to have anything to do with iniquity. They will depart from it. They will run from it. That's the seal of God. The one that we keep talking about. This is what it's all about. Knowing God and being known of Him. That's what the prayer life is. For this is life eternal, Jesus says, that they might know Thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom Thou hast sent. God knows the way because the way is Christ. But those who pretended to be Christians or only profess to be Christians in the end will have to be hear these words from Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. These people were casting out demons. They were doing great works. Oh, people looked up to them and admired them, by the way. People were saying all manner of good things about them. But it's not what people say about you that counts. It's what Jesus says about you that counts. Do you know him intimately? Or is your knowledge of him afar off? When Peter followed Jesus afar off, he denied him. Are you following him afar off? Or are you following him closely? Do you love to spend time in prayer? Do you love to spend time with the Word of God? Is it, is it a delight for you to know God? Is it a delightful thing to spend time with? Is it more delightful than anything in this world has to offer? If it's not, you can ask God for the desire today to make it more delightful. If God is speaking to your heart. John Hughes said, Prayer is neither black magic nor is it a form of demand note. Prayer is a relationship. The act of praying is more analogous to clearing away the underbrush which shuts out of you than it is begging in the street. There are many different kinds of prayer, yet all prayer has this one basic purpose. We pray not to necessarily get something, but to open up a two-way street between us and God so that we and others may inwardly become transformed. That's what it is. Augustine said, if you would never cease to pray, never cease to long for it. The continuance of your longing is the continuance of your prayer. Do you long for God today? Or do you long for other things? The more you long for Him, the more time you will spend with Him, and the more you will enjoy that time. And John Chrysostom, that great father, wrote this, He that enjoys anything without thanksgiving, it's as though he robbed God. Did you catch that? Anything in this life that we enjoy without giving thanks to God for it, it's like we robbed Him because it came from Him. And so think about your life today. How are you living it? Where are you? What are you doing with the delight of the Word of God? What are you doing with the still small voice that calls to you every day? David Brainerd, the great missionary to the aboriginals in America in the 1700s, once went to a new area to go and to minister. And he was riding on his horse. And he got off his horse. And the first thing he did when he got off his horse is he didn't look around to see how many of them there were. He didn't try to do a survey to count how many houses there were and how many different cultures were there. He didn't have a committee meeting to decide how, what methodology they were going to use to reach them. He got up off his horse by himself in the middle of nowhere in a wilderness where these dear Indian people were and he got on his knees and he started praying. And he was praying and thanking God for safe traveling mercies and he was praying for the wisdom that, to, for God to give him the words to speak to these people and he was praying that their hearts would be open to the gospel so that they could accept Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And as he was praying, he didn't realize it, but two things were happening. One, God had his eye on him. Two, the Indians had their eye on him. They were in the bu bushes. And they were looking through the bushes and they were looking at this man on his knees and they, were, they had their weapons ready and their blow darts and everything, their spears, their poison tip arrows, everything was ready to go. And one man said, should we get him now? And the other chief says, no, leave him alone. Look next to him a few feet there. And they looked a few feet and there was a rattlesnake making its way to him with a killing step going right toward him. They said, don't worry about it. The rattlesnake's going to finish him off. 
And David Brainerd didn't even notice the rattlesnake around them because he was too wrapped up in God. And then the rattlesnake comes ever closer and ever closer and it gets to a point where it's just a few feet from him and suddenly it just stops as if it hits a brick wall, shakes itself off, turns around and takes off into the bushes. And then one of the men said, should we get him now? And the chief says, are you kidding? This man is protected by God. The great spirit, we don't dare touch him. We better listen to what he has to say. Power of prayer. Can it still happen? Absolutely. But we have to have that kind of raw, innocent, beautiful faith that David Brainerd had. The man would spend hours with his shirt running through with sweat, praying for those people. And even his interpreter, who was a drunkard, got converted by translating one of his sermons. Because he trusted in God. He wasn't interested in what people were saying and doing. He trusted in prayer. The blessedness of prayer, my dear ones, is that it gets us into a place where we can spend time with the divine, to be alone with the alone, to be with the one who we love, the one who has his grace and his peace to give us that surpasses understanding, the one who will give us everything we need because he is our God and our King and our everything. Christ becomes, for the man of prayer, his all in all. And he begins to live an otherworldly life. Don't you want that life? I want that life. I'm tired of lukewarm Christianity. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of the roller coaster ride. I want a revival in my life, don't you? I need it. I'm thirsty for it. I want this kind of blessedness. Don't you? God has given you a desire for it. And maybe you're not a Christian today. And that's okay. You want to enter into that life of prayer. This could be your first prayer to Jesus today. To make you whole. To give you forgiveness. To give you life everlasting. And for us who have known him afar off for too long. We want to say to Jesus today. Draw me nearer, O Lord. Would you like to say to that to the Lord today? If you'd like to say to that, please join me. If you can kneel wherever possible. If you can't kneel, you can just bow your head. But if you can physically kneel, kneel with me. And let us seek him today. O oh Lord, how blessed is the man. We have been looking at a portrait of a man of prayer. And we can look no further than the great pattern that has been set before us of Jesus Christ who was the most blessed of all men, came to this world. He denied the counsel of the ungodly. He did not walk in the way of sinners. He did not sit in the, sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight was in the law of the Lord, and in his law did he meditate day and night. And he was like a tree planted by rivers of water who can give water to thirsty souls today. Blessed Jesus, who not only was the tree, but he died on a tree so that those rivers of living water could be poured out in abundance to his people. And oh Lord God, today we feel like we are unrooted, ungrounded, shallow. We feel like we're following thee afar off. We pray, dear God, that thou wilt forgive us for our sinful neglect of thy still small voice, our sinful neglect of a life of prayer, a life that is hid with Christ in God, a life that is so wonderful and so delightful and so joyful that the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. A life, O oh Lord, that will not allow the world to rush in, but instead will rush into the world with a testimony, a vibrant testimony of Jesus Christ. And O oh Lord, today we plead that we will walk closer to Thee, for this is the answer, O oh Lord to know Thee and to be known of Thee. And oh, Father God, we long to be ever closer to Jesus each and every day of our lives. And so, Father, give us a desire, an overwhelming desire, to spend more time with divine things and to spend less time with worldly things. Give us a disdain for the things of the world. Give us a love for the people of the world, but a disdain for their sins. 
Give us, O oh Lord, a grace whereby we might come ever nearer to Thee, humbly, on our knees, spend that precious time that we need to spend as families, as individuals, as a church, that we might spend more time together in the blessedness of prayer. Lord, when all is said and done and Jesus comes, may we be rooted and grounded in Him. May we be able to stand in the judgment. May we be able to be in the congregation of the righteous because we love Thee now with every fiber and every ounce of our strength. We thank Thee and we praise Thee for what Thou art about to do in our lives. And we ask all these things in the blessed and holy name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen.